is part 6 of WCF video series. In this video, we'll discuss what are data contracts and data members with an example. This is continuation to part 5, so please watch part 5 from the WCF video series before proceeding with this video. Let's understand data contracts and data members with an example. Let's implement an employee WCF service. This service should have two operations. The first operation should be get employee. If we give it an employee ID, it should query the database table, retrieve the respective employee and return that employee back. The second operation should be save employee. If we give it an employee object, it should save that employee object to the database table. We also want a client application that is going to interact with this employee WCF service. The user interface of the client application should be this. If we enter an employee ID, and when we click this button get employee this client application should send that employee ID to the WCF service which is going to retrieve that employee from the database table give that to the client application and the client application should display those employee details um, in the user interface if we enter a new employee details and then once we click the save button the client application should hand that employee object to the WCF service which is going to persist that employee object to the database table. So the first step here is to actually create the employee table. So let's flip to SQL Server Management Studio. I have already created this table and here is the SQL script to create that table and this script will insert some sample data into that table and here I have two stored procedures as well. SP get employee and this stored procedure is going to get an employee by ID. So if we give it an ID, then this stored procedure is going to retrieve ID name, gender and date of birth from table employee where ID equal to whatever we are going to pass to the stored procedure. And the second stored procedure is SP save employee and it has got ID name, gender and date of birth parameters. So we are going to pass value th values for those parameters and this stored procedure is simply going to insert the values of these parameters into this table TBL employee. So very simple stored procedures. I'll have this entire script available on my blog in case you need it. Alright, now let's flip to Visual Studio and implement the employee WCF service. So let's create a new project. Let's create a class library project and let's call this employee service and let's rename this class 1.cs file to employee.cs and this will ask us if we also want to rename the class name from class 1.cs uh, class 1 to employee click yes so that should rename the name of the employee now we need to have um, four private fields and four public properties basically these properties are used to encapsulate ID name gender and date of birth columns from this table TBL employee and in order to speed things up, I have already implemented the code for the private fields and the public properties. So let's copy that from the notepad and paste that into the employee class. So here we have got the four private fields and the respective public properties which are going to expose those private fields. So very simple employee class here. Now let's go ahead and add a WCF service search for WCF, select WCF service and let's call our WCF service as employee service. Now within the iEmployeeService.cs file we want to have two operations. The first operation is going to be get employee and this is going to take ID that is the employee ID and what should this method do? It should return an employee object. So the return type is going to be employee. And we want another operation contract that is save employee. And to this method we are going to pass an employee object. Let's call the employee object as employee and save employee is not going to return anything so the return type is going to be void. Now let's implement these two methods within the implementation file which is employee service.cs. 
So to implement this interface, simply select this option, implement interface I employee service, and that should generate the method stubs for us. Let's get rid of this to work method. All right. Now here we are going to write some ADO.NET code to retrieve data from the database table TBL employee. And to speed things up, I have already implemented the code, I mean the ADO.NET code for this get employee. So let's copy that from the notepad. And paste that within get employee. And if you look at this code, it's straightforward ADO.NET code. And we have some compilation errors here. That's basically because we need to import some of the required ADO.NET namespaces. So let's go ahead and do that. We need system.data, system.data.sql client, and system.configuration. All right. Now, if you look at the implementation, it's pretty straightforward. And again, look at this here. Configuration manager is showing a compilation error it basically says it doesn't exist but if you notice we have included that namespace system.configuration that's basically because this class library project doesn't have a reference to system.configuration assembly so let's go ahead and add that reference so system.configuration and that should get rid of that compilation error. And if you look at this ADO.NET code, it's very straightforward. If you are new to ADO.NET, um, I have recorded some videos you know, to cover the basics of ADO.NET. So please watch them from the ADO.NET tutorial. All right, so what are we doing here within this get uh, employee method? We are creating an instance of employee object. And then we are reading the connection string dbcs you know, from um, a configuration file. Now at the moment if you look at this class library project we have app.config file but we are not going to include connection string within this app.config file. Let's delete that app.config file. We'll actually host this employee service in a console application and that console application is going to have an uh, app.config file and within that app.config file we are going to have this connection string. Okay, so basically we are going to read the connection string from that application configuration file and using that connection string we are building the SQL connection object and next we are building SQL command object and notice the command name spgetEmployee which is nothing but the name of the stored procedure and since it's a stored procedure we have to tell that to the command object and we do that by specifying the command type property and then this stored procedure expects an ID parameter because we want to get an employee by ID. So here <clears throat> we are creating a SQL parameter object. The name of the parameter is ID and the value is nothing but the value that is going to be coming into this method parameter. Okay. And then finally we are adding that parameter object to the command object, opening the connection, executing the command. Okay. And then we are retrieving the values that we retrieve uh, from the database and then assigning them to the properties of the employee object that we have created on this line. And then finally, we are returning that employee object back. So straightforward get employee method there. Okay. And then similarly, for the save employee method, if we give it an employee object, we should save that employee object to the database table. Again, we need to write ADO.NET code to speed things up. I have already implemented the required ADO.NET code. So let's go ahead and copy this and paste it in that function in Visual Studio. All right. So if you look at this ADO.NET code, again, this is straightforward. Here we have a compilation error. That's basically because the employee object has got a small e here, but the parameter itself is with capital E. So let's change it to small e. Now again, we are reading the connection string from the application configuration file, we're building the SQL connection, and then the SQL command. Look at the SQL command, sp save employee, and this stored procedure has got several parameters. We need to pass the ID, name, gender, and date of birth um, parameters. And to create those parameters, here we have the code, so we are creating SQL parameter object, specifying the name and the value. And look at where the value is coming from. The value is coming from the property of the employee object that's coming into the save employee function. Okay, and 
we are adding that parameter object to the command. So that's for the ID parameter. That's for name, gender, and then date of birth. And then we are opening the connection, executing the query. All right, so we are done implementing our employee WCF service. The next step is to host this service, and we are going to make use of a console application to do that. So let's add a new project to the solution. Let's add a console application, and let's call this employee service host. And the first step here is to add an application configuration file. So let's add an application configuration file. And we discussed the configuration that is required to host a WCF service in the previous sessions of this video series. So I'm not going to get the basics um, of that configuration. And again, to speed things up, I have that configuration already implemented. So let me go ahead and copy that configuration and paste that into the app.config file. And the first thing that you will notice here is the connection strings section. Remember, within our employee service, we are trying to read a connection string. Okay, so this dbcs connection string is present in this app.config file here, which is basically pointing to the SQL Server installation that is running on my machine. And then here we have system.service model section, which is basically the configuration to host this employee WCF service. Okay, now I'm not going to get into the details of this configuration. We discussed the basics of that um, in the previous sessions. I'll have this configuration available on my blog in case you need it. All right, so with all these changes, you know, we should be up and running. Uh, before that, let's set this employee service host as the startup project. And then let's run this. Um, actually, we need to write code to host the service. So within our program.cs file, now, first of all, to host a WCF service, we need to add references to two things. The first thing is to the employee service itself. So let's go ahead and do that first. So employee service. And the second thing is to add a reference to system.service model assembly, which is the main WCF assembly. All right, and then within this program.cs file, we need to import system.service model assembly, uh, sorry, namespace. So system.service model. And within the main method, let's create an instance of service host. Let's call it host equals new service host. And we need to specify the type of our service. And in order to do that, we use the type of keyword and the name of our type is employee service, which is present in employee service namespace. And we are going to open the host. Let's print the date and time that the host has started. And in order to do that, um, let's simply say host started. at whatever is the date and time that the host has started. And in order to keep this alive, the console application, let's use console.readline. All right, with these changes, let's go ahead and run this. So the host has started. The next step is to create uh, the client application. So let's fire up another instance of Visual Studio. And then let's create a new project. And here we want to create an empty ASP.NET web application. And let's call it client. And the first thing that we have to do here is to add a reference to our WCF service. And if you look at the configuration of our WCF service, the base address for the service is this one, localhost colon 8080. So let's copy that URL. Let's go back to the console application. Right click on the references folder, add a service reference and then specify the base URL of your service. Click Go button. This should discover the employee service. 
let's give it a meaningful namespace let's call it employee service and click OK so this should generate a proxy class now let's go ahead and add a web form to this project and we need to design this web form in such a way that it looks like this and to speed things up I have implemented the required HTML so let's go ahead copy this HTML and paste that into our web form and if I flip it to the design mode you can see the same design that we have on the slide okay and we have a label control here basically to display the status a message okay alright now let's double click on this get employee button to generate the click event handler similarly click event handler for save employee alright now here we need to create an instance of the proxy class and if you remember the namespace that we have used is employee service so employee service dot employee service client so let's create an instance of that and then all we do is get employee we invoke the get employee method and to this method we need to pass the ID the ID is going to come from this particular text box and the ID of this text box is txt ID so let's retrieve the text from it and we need to convert that to an integer alright and if you look at this get employee method what is it returning back it's returning look at the IntelliSense it's returning an employee object and that's employee object is present in employee service namespace so within employee service we have got this employee class and let's call it employee so we have the employee object back from the service what we need to do we need to display name gender and date of birth properties within the respective text box controls and to speed things up I have written that code as well so let's copy that so if you look at this code it's again straightforward we are saying txt um, name text box equals name gender equals gender date of birth equals date of birth okay date of birth returns date time so we need to convert that to a string basically we are converting that to a short date string so that we don't get the time part of it if there is any okay and finally within the label control which has got an ID of LBL message we are displaying this message employee retrieved alright now we need to implement save employee now again we need to create an instance of the proxy class so let's copy that code and paste it right here and then invoke save employee method and this method expects an employee object to be passed so we need to pass the employee object so let's go ahead and construct our employee object populate its properties with the values from the controls on the UI and in order to do that again I have implemented the required code so let's copy and paste that right here so first let's create an employee object and where is the employee object present with an employee service namespace and let's call the instance employee so we are setting its properties and we should hand that employee object to save employee method and finally within the label control we should display the message so let's say employee saved alright with all these changes let's go ahead run the application and see if it works as expected alright so now let's enter an employee ID 1 and click get employee look at that we get the employee as expected and let's save a new employee let's say 4 let's say Todd as the name of the employee male and let's say date of birth is 10 10 1981 and let's save this employee it says employee saved let's quickly check the database table if you have got a new record there 
all right so the service the client application everything is working as expected so now the point is where does this WCF data contract and data member comes into play now first of all in order to understand them first let's understand what we mean by serialization with respect to WCF so with respect to WCF serialization is the process of converting a dotnet object into an XML representation okay so basically the employee object okay needs to be converted into an XML format okay and that process is known as serialization and the reverse process that is reconstructing the same object from XML back into dotnet employee object is called as deserialization and in order to do the serialization the default in WCF is data contract serializer so there's a component called data contract serializer which will serialize data for us into XML and into .NET representations so let's go ahead and look at how this data contract serializer is going to serialize you know objects like employee student um, customer etc okay now if you look at the employee class within our employee service look at this at the moment we haven't done anything special in order to have this employee class serialized now for a complex type like customer employee student to be serialized that complex type can either be decorated with serializable attribute or data contract attribute but if you look at our employee class it's not decorated with any of them but still you know everything is working as expected so how is that possible that's basically because with dotnet 3.5 service pack 1 and above we don't have to explicitly use data contract or data member attributes the data contract serializer that is the component which does serialization for us in WCF you know is going to automatically serialize all public properties of the complex type and it will do that in an alphabetical order and by default private fields and properties are not serialized so if you look at our employee class it has got four private fields and four public properties by default the data contract serializer is going to serialize all these public properties that is ID name gender and date of birth okay now in order to pr prove that let's actually get to the Vistal document that this service generates okay and to get to the Vistal document we give it the base address of the service and the base address is basically HTTP colon for slash localhost colon 8080 so let's get to that URL and click on this and basically here on this file we don't see the employee object but then if you look at you know this line right here we've got something called data contract okay we'll come to the data contract in just a bit but this is the schema location for the employee object so let's copy that URL and then let's paste it in another instance of the browser and look at this we've got you know the type as employee and look at the property names date of birth gender ID name and notice the order in which they are present they are present in alphabetical order okay so the data contract serializer has serialized the employee object into its XML representation okay so by default if you don't decorate you know the employee class the data contract serializer um, is going to serialize all the public properties of that class in an alphabetical order into its XML representation all right if we decorate a complex type with serializable attribute remember to serialize a complex type you know there are two ways you can either decorate it with serializable attribute or data contract attribute now the preferred way is to actually decorate it with data contract attribute in a bit we'll discuss the reasons why but then we can also decorate it with serializable attribute if we decorate it with a serializable attribute then the data contract serializer serializes all fields 
and with the serializable attribute we will not have any explicit control on what fields we want to include and exclude from serialized data. Let's actually look at that in action. Now if you look at this serialized data, look at this, the public properties are serialized for us by default, all the public properties. But then let's go ahead and decorate this employee class with serializable attribute. And by the way, the serializable attribute, um, I mean, the data contract attribute is present in system.runtime.serialization uh, namespace. So let's go ahead and include the serializable attribute. And let's close the service, which is already running. And then let's rerun it. Right. Now let's refresh this page. And look at this instead of you know serializing the public properties when we have decorated the complex type that is our employee class with serializable attribute it has serialized all the private fields and now let's say for example for some reason we don't want date of birth to be returned to the client I know we don't want that to be serialized if you want to achieve that, you know, if you want to exclude this date of birth from serialized data, and if you're using serializable attribute, you can't really do anything about it at the moment, you know, with the default behavior. You don't have any explicit control on which fields to include and exclude from the serialized data when you use serializable attribute. On the other hand, when we use data contract attribute, so basically this data contract attribute is present in system.runtime.serialization namespace. So let's go ahead and bring that in. So when we decorate this employee class with data contract attribute, then we will have explicit control on which properties or fields that we want to include and exclude from this serialized data. And the way we achieve that is by decorating you know these fields and properties with data member attribute so for example let's say I want this public properties all of the public properties to be included in serialization then decorate each of them with data member attribute okay uh, for now let's just decorate ID and name Let's close the host that's already running, rerun the project. Let's get to the schema, refresh the page, and look at that. Since we have decorated only ID and name properties, they are only included in the serialized data. So now with data contract and data member attributes, we have got an explicit control on what properties and fields as well. So for example, if I include the data member attribute on this field the fee this field will also be serialized so irrespective of whether it is a private field or a public property as long as you apply it data member attribute it is going to be serialized and if you want to exclude them from serialized data don't apply that attribute it's as simple as that so using data contract and data member attributes you have got a lot of flexibility on what to include and not to include from serialized data so if we decorate a complex type with data contract attribute the data contract serializer serializes the fields as well as properties that are marked with data member attribute the fields that are not marked with data member attribute are excluded from serialization. The data member attribute can be applied either on the private fields or public properties, but I prefer applying them to public properties. That's basically because if you look at our public properties, they have got you know meaningful names without an underscore. Usually the convention is the private fields you know will have an underscore in them. So now let's go ahead and apply this data contract attribute to all of the members all of the public properties I mean so now you know all public properties should be serialized okay so obviously to serialize a type we have two ways you can either decorate that with serializable attribute or data contract attribute 
you know there are other ways as well we'll discuss them in a later video session but keep in mind in WCF the preferred and the most common way of serialization is to mark the type with a data contract attribute and mark each member that needs to be serialized with data member attribute and that is basically because we have several advantages of using data contract and data member attributes first of all using data contract attribute you can define an XML namespace for your data at the moment actually let's close this let's rerun our employee service and let's refresh the schema and look at that we get date of birth gender ID all public properties basically and look at that they are again in alphabetical order and if you look at the ID it's somewhere in the middle name is in the end you know it doesn't really make sense to have ID somewhere in the middle I expect that to be you know the first item to be serialized and then name and then maybe date of birth and gender now is it possible to control you know the order of these properties you know in which they are serialized absolutely that's the advantage of using data member attribute okay first let's look at this using data contract attribute we can define an XML namespace for our data so if you look at the target namespace here you know it is using the default URL which is schemas dot data contract and something there now you can specify you know something like your domain name forward slash and you can give it like employee or whatever you want okay basically you can give it your own unique namespace where you know that serialized data will live in and in order to do that you specify namespace property on the data contract attribute so data contract is applied on the type itself and it has got name space property and then for example here let's say HTTP colon for slash for slash localhost um, let's actually give it a meaningful domain name which is pregimtech.com for slash you can give it something like 2013 and you know a year and a month and then maybe something like 0707 and then employee you know basically because giving it month year month date and year allows you actually to version that we'll discuss versioning in a later video session but with this change let's actually run this and let's refresh this and notice the target namespace at the moment it's the default one but once we refresh we should get the namespace that we have given it all right now The other advantage is you can specify name, order, and whether if a property or field is required or not. Okay, and we do that using data member attribute. So if we go to the employee service, so these are the members that we want to include in serialization, and this data member attribute has got several parameters. So name, for example. So let's say for some reason we want you know the ID to be serialized you know with capital letters as ID if that's the case use name property and you can also use order property at the moment if you notice the order is alphabetical but let's say I want ID as number one name as number two date of birth three and gender four if that's the case use order order expects an integer value so we want ID to be number one so we specify the order as one and similarly for name I want that to be 2 and gender to be 3 and date of birth to be 4 alright so let's close our host and run it once more let's refresh this notice that the ID name is in capital letters now and look at the order it has changed okay so that's the benefit of using data contract and data member I've got a lot of flexibility there and it will also allow you to serialize private fields and properties as well if you want to include them in serialization simply apply the data member attribute 
Okay, so service contract, operation contract, data contract. Three very important things to keep in mind as far as WCF services are concerned. So if you want to impl you know, make something a WCF service, you decorate that with the w uh, service contract attribute. If you want to expose methods um, to the clients, then you d decorate those methods with operation contract attribute. And then within a type, if you want to have certain properties and fields to be serialized, you know, you decorate that type with data contract attribute and the fields and properties that you want to include and exclude in serialization, you know, you either include or exclude data member attribute from those respective fields or properties. All right, and keep in mind the preferred way of serialization in WCF is to use data contract serializer and to decorate the type with data contract and members with data member attribute. That's it for today. Thank you for listening. Have a great day.